I've been told it's a question that has no answer. But that hasn't stopped me from searching for one. We understand what he does, but it's never been clear where he came from or why he does it. Who is he, really? Who is the garbage ape? Since his debut in 2008, the garbage ape has been a staple character of the franchise, and in the 15 years since the character's inception has been featured in dozens of Heathcliff panels. But the legacy of Heathcliff goes far beyond this, and is largely known as a series that went off the rails. If you're familiar with it, you're probably more familiar with what it's turned into. When it was created in 1973 by brothers George Gately and John Gallagher, the series was built on offbeat comedy, and while it would push the boundaries of what was acceptable in the paper, rarely would it step outside of the scope of standard cartoon humor. And while it would never reach the levels of success and acclaim as its contemporary, Garfield, who, despite being syndicated five years later than Heathcliff, has become the most profitable newspaper enterprise in history. Heathcliff carved out a niche for itself and comfortably sat within it for decades. It wasn't until Peter Gallagher, nephew of the two brothers, took the reins of the series in 1998, allowing his uncles to formally retire. And after George Gately's death in 2001, when the series was in Peter's full control, he did his best to maintain the stylistic choices of his uncles, in an attempt to continue the series as it had been up to that point. But as the years pressed on, the series pivoted, slowly leaning more into surrealism. And ten years after Pete took ownership of the series, we see the introduction of the Garbage Ape. The character's page on Heathcliff.com attempts to explain who he is. The mysterious garbage ape comes at night to bring delicious garbage, <coughs> oh. much to the delight of hungry Heathcliff and his pals. He has never been seen by humans. And yet, in his debut appearance from March 23rd, 2008, he was named by Iggy Nutmeg, compatriot of Heathcliff and known human. Grandpa Nutmeg and Iggy both turned their heads, clearly acknowledging that they can see him leave. But it could be that they were simply looking in the direction of the sounds they heard, or the havoc that was wreaked upon the ape's exit. This wouldn't have confirmed that they, or at least Iggy, saw him if he didn't specifically identify him as an ape. He names him the Garbage Knight Ape, though in later appearances he's simply known as the Garbage Ape, and his design is slightly changed. Less stout, a more consistent walnut brown as opposed to light gray. The expression is more neutral, if not slightly contented, whereas the original depiction saw a look of determination. If this is a different character, where did he go? There was over a five year span between this ape's debut and his subsequent reappearance, and if these are both the same apes, how was it possible for Iggy to identify him if no human has ever seen him? On July 13th, 2022, we see seemingly the Garbage Ape's second appearance in front of other humans, though the question is raised as to whether or not this is even truly the ape or just an actor portraying him. And yet, once again, Iggy is the only one who's able to name the character directly, implying he's seen him in the past. Why? Why is Iggy the only human able to identify the Garbage Ape? Could it be that Heathcliff and Iggy's brotherly relationship goes further than just a boy and his beloved pet? I believe that the answer to the Garbage Ape's origins lies within the one longest running unanswered question. A question that has existed since 1973 and was first asked by Heathcliff's creator, George Gately. Who were Iggy's parents? And where did they go? I've scoured every volume of Heathcliff knowledge I could get my hands on, and the answer remains unclear. Only one man knows the truth, the man who inherited the series and created the mythos of the Garbage Ape. In October of 2022, at the Comics Crossroads Columbus Art and Animation Festival, Peter was on a panel where he finally answered the question. And also, too, I've had people ask me, too, there's the grandparents, right, and there's Iggy. 
And a lot of people are like, what happened to Iggy's parents? And I'm like, eh, who cares? You know, like, I, I do care. I, I, of course, I care about it, but I'm not going to explain it. It's like, this, this, this is the family. And also, oh. that's the correct answer, though. Right. Like, you oh, know, okay. You don't have to know the track. So I, I guess it doesn't actually matter. If you're familiar with Heathcliff and you didn't live through the 1980s, you've likely either seen some of the comics in your local newspaper or floating around on social media. But let's be real, if you're in the former camp, you probably lived through the 1980s, and I can pretty confidently say that there's really nothing else like it out there. It's got a real individuality to it, where even by a single panel, you get a sense that its identity is pretty firmly cemented. It doesn't necessarily mean you understand what that identity is, but you can definitely tell that it has one. It's easy to assume that Heathcliff is a series that's built around inside jokes. I've seen this identity attached to it online quite a bit, and it's even a sentiment that I've echoed myself more than once. But the more of these comics I read, I've come to realize that that's just a bad way to describe it. Calling this an inside joke carries the implication of exclusivity, that if you don't understand the humor, it's just not for you, and that it's only a little wink and an elbow nudge for the people who are going to appreciate it. And at this point, I just don't think that's the case. That isn't to say the series doesn't use a lot of recurring jokes and self-referential humor, because it absolutely does. In fact, one of the staples of modern Heathcliff is how many times the same subject matter can be repurposed with a different punchline attached to it. And sometimes the same punchline, but hey, when you've been going for 50 years, there are bound to be some repeats. There are obviously the big ones, like Heathcliff eating a lot of food, or doing a bad job of chasing mice, or generally just being a gosh darn scoundrel, but if you dig into the series, there are a lot of recurring themes here that have basically nothing to do with Heathcliff being a cat. For example, let's just pick something at random here, uh, Heathcliff being shot out of a cannon. Perfect. A newcomer to the series might look at this and go, why? <laughs> Why is he shooting himself out of a cannon? Which is a perfectly reasonable question, and as somewhat of a Heathcliff expert, I can tell you authoritatively why. He just... He just kind of does that sometimes. In fact, now that I think about it, he just kind of does... a lot of things. As has already been established, we've got Heathcliff being shot out of a cannon. Heathcliff walking on the ceiling, or otherwise defying gravity. Wearing fishbowls as hats. Wizardry. Contemplating life whilst sitting on garbage. Robots. More robots. Somehow, even more robots. The garbage ape. Wizard robots. Wizard garbage ape. The meat store. And its little brother, the meat museum. Tanks of various branding. Like stands. And to top it all off, giant mice. With as much going on with this particular selection of comics, there's one very critical thing that they all have in common. They were all published in the year 2020. The amount of chaotic energy that was packed into such a short span of time is frankly admirable, and it's a perfect representation of the kind of humor that this series is built on. We all coped with 2020 in our own ways, and I'm very grateful that Peter Gallagher channeled his energy into the comic, because it's... I mean, look at this. It's beautiful. Now, you might automatically assume that this is a lawless comic where chaos reigns, which is probably a fair assumption, given what I just showed you, but there are a handful of rules that you'll notice between every single panel comic. The titular character is almost always featured in some capacity, and you'll generally see a side character, whether an established recurring one or some innocent bystander who was roped into whatever nonsense Heathcliff is doing who provides the caption at the bottom of the comic. Cats never talk. Certain animals will provide the caption at the bottom, but they're never directly speaking to humans, they usually only talk to each other. Speaking of speaking, Heathcliff himself doesn't do that. Like, ever. I wouldn't even say he's the protagonist, really, he's more of a force of nature that everybody in the world has to deal with. 
Not even we as the audience get to understand his thought process. He just, he just kind of happens. Or more specifically, everything in the comic happens because of something he's either already done or is about to do. And when you look at it that way, the whole series starts to make a lot more sense. Okay, well really, it doesn't make more sense, because that's not exactly how it's supposed to work, but that perspective should help make it all click. This panel in particular perfectly exemplifies that style of comedic sensibility. All we know here is that his plan worked. And what was that plan? <laughs> I couldn't tell you if I wanted to, but quite frankly, I don't want to. A big portion of Heathcliff's comedy is derived from the absence of information. Those are the things that I found really hilarious are people that just do something. Like earlier, they were asking, they're like, oh, who are your biggest influence? Who's your, some of your favorite comic strips? And I just said, just picking one, I was like, the comic strip Herman by uh, Jim Unger. It doesn't run anymore, or maybe it does in repeats. But there was one where there's a, he drew these guys that were just these big guys with glasses and they were, you know, and, and he, there was a guy like that dressed in a bee costume in a, in a bed of, in one of these flowers, these bushes of like flowers. And there's a policeman and he's like, I'm telling you for the last time, get out of those flowers. You know, and it's just, I just thought it was so funny. And it was like, I don't know if it makes sense, but it just cracked me up and there's no explanation for it. Yeah, sometimes the joke is, is, uh, there's a little bit of room for you to wonder, right? Yeah. And not every joke has to be spelled out to the point where where you can just explain it, right? Yes, and I I, I think that there's a a fine line. It's like if you over explain it, you ruin it. And and I've come to the conclusion that it's like this fine line. How much do I explain? How much? And I my philosophy, what I've decided is that I'm going to under explain it and leave it up to people to see if they like it or not, and not over explain. Over explaining is ruining it. Under explaining it might be a little confusing, but I think it's better that way. I don't know. I might be wrong, but that's the way that I like to do it. And that gives you a little, a really tight rope to walk, right? Because you really. It can be easy to forget that this series has been around since 1973 because the sense of humor has evolved pretty dramatically. That isn't to say it wasn't funny back then, otherwise, it probably would have stopped being made a long time ago. Well, okay, the family circus is still going. <clears throat> anyway, the fact that the series has persisted for half a century is because there was always something special about it. But even after 50 years, the comic was able to find a middle ground somewhere between classic boomer humor and weird internet humor. And what we get is the perfect amount of stupid. Take quite possibly my favorite new addition to the series, for example, Jimmy the Frog. Heathcliff, for whatever reason, is enamored with this guy, and all he wants to do is share him with the rest of the world, but nobody in the comic seems to care about him at all. I like to think there's nothing special about him, and it's just some frog that Heathcliff found on the side of the road one day. <laughs> but we don't get an explanation for why he loves Jimmy, and that's kind of why it's funny. He just loves this stupid little guy. Look at his dumb face. Look at it. But what makes it even funnier is how well Jimmy was received on Twitter. Everybody immediately loved him. In the world of the comic, he's ignored by everybody. But in reality, there's Jimmy merch. This evolution of humor didn't happen overnight. In fact, it was a pretty intentional decision on Peter's part. I did, when I started changing it from standard gags, I actually did have in mind, I love the idea of taking a traditional like household name comic and turning it on its head but keeping the drawing exactly like it was before and i was the one person who was doing it so i i tried this thing and it could have totally flopped and failed and i feel so fortunate that people have responded in a positive right. way that and it takes it took guts too you told me when we talked last time that you were nervous about doing that uh, that you didn't want to disrespect your uncles, that you didn't want to disrespect the legacy of the strip. That was all very serious to you. Yeah. So for people to see it and be like, ah, he's just wrecking Heathcliff, <laughs> or completely misunderstanding your intent. Right. Because you wanted to do Heathcliff correctly, even if it were different, right? Nothing is quite as emblematic of the transition from traditional gag writing into the now more abstract and surreal sense of humor than helmets. This is the first Heathcliff panel I ever saw. 
My modern comic reading sensibilities told me to try and dissect it, because the joke had to be hidden under a layer of pop culture references, or maybe there's some play on words that I didn't understand, or maybe it was an inside joke I wasn't a part of, and that's, that's not how you read these. Don't think about what is currently happening. Think about what could have led up to this point and what is going to happen as a result. If you read the caption like a one-liner in a sitcom, don't order ham, (laughs) then it's just stupid. So let's take a step back and look at the facts. One, Heathcliff, a cat, is in a deli, a place where cats are probably not supposed to be. Two, he's wearing a helmet. We will never know where he got it, why or how he customized it, or what the helmets truly represent. We simply know that he has it. Three, the shopkeeper should probably just kick him out of his deli. I mean, he's a cat. But instead of doing that, he warns his customer. These indicate to me that Heathcliff is an unstoppable force, like a cryptid, like Westminster, the city where Heathcliff takes place is the setting for a horror movie, and Heathcliff is the monster. So really, the caption should read like this. Whatever you do, don't order ham. I know this doesn't solve the mystery of what the helmets represent, but it's not supposed to. Let's take a look at this one. Is it ham that is for dinner? Or are they gonna... or... (laughs) Are they going to eat the helmets? You know what? I actually had more planned for this one, but we're just going to move on because that was funnier than anything I had written down. The way I like to interpret these two is that they're exercising caution. You could think of the helmets as like a Marvel t-shirt that you wear to the newest movie because you're a fan, or having a bespoke safety helmet that you only use while you're doing something dangerous, like making an industrial quantity of gravy. There's just, (laughs) I don't know. Something about that is funny to me. Okay, look, I guess if you actually want to know what the deal with helmets is, let's hear it from the man himself. A lot of people with the helmets, they're like, well, what is is it? The helmets are something he wants? And I'm like, I don't know. I just do what I... If I sit something funny could be on a helmet, I'd like doing that. I don't know. It could be something. He's wearing a helmet. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Like, that's the explanation, right? Right, right. Sometimes, sometimes a a helmet is just a helmet. That's right. That's right. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Gum is another commonly recurring gag in modern Heathcliff. People blow a bubble and they float. But what I love so much about it is the way this silly, cartoony logic finds its way integrated into the fabric of society. What started off as Big Bubble Makes You Float has turned into a valid method of transportation. The bubble gum reminds me of how you have said that the way you came up with that was you probably saw an image of someone floating in a, a book of cartoon drawings that you had mm-hmm. and thought it looked fun. Yeah. And you drew, you know, just someone floating with the bubble gum. And like, that was the reason for yeah. it. So the origin of this ongoing joke that keeps showing up in your comic is that you thought it was fun to draw, right? Yeah. Do you ever have a situation where someone is just really intent on learning what something means? And you're just like, oh, I thought, I thought it was cool. I had Heathcliff uh, riding on the back of like a bison or something. And, and it was like, I forget what the caption was, but somebody in the comments was just like, I think Gallagher just wanted to draw a bison. And it's kind of like that. Like, I'm like, oh, uh, that's cool. I, somebody I, finally understood yeah. Heathcliff. <laughs> And there's an inherent bit of logic with this joke, but there are some that in a vacuum might not make any sense at all. Like, um... (laughs) No, this this one's just funny. (sighs) Okay, there's gotta be some absurd crap in here somewhere. (laughs) Okay, yeah, no, this one... This one is also just funny. I don't know why, but I love it. Okay, here we go. This one is perfect. Let's just pretend, for the sake of this exercise, that this is the first Heathcliff panel you've ever seen in your life. Instead of shaking your head in bewilderment, just remember the golden rule of reading Heathcliff. Don't think about what's currently happening. Think about what could have led up to this point and what's going to happen later. I don't know about you, uh, but the idea of four grown men dressed like Abraham Lincoln beating the snot out of a cat while his family casually watches through the window is pretty hilarious to me. So, if you've ever wondered what on earth could have possibly compelled him to draw something like that, the answer is... it was fun. That's it.
That's kind of how the majority of the jokes in Heathcliff got started in the first place. If we look back at the origins of the garbage ape, it was because, well, Pete needed a comic to go out on Easter and wanted something funny to juxtapose with the Easter Bunny. So, I don't know, how about an ape that throws garbage around? And the rest is history. Wonderful, absurd history. My relationship with this series started off as a passing fascination with something that seemed unknowable to me. Like I was peering into a tome of forbidden knowledge, and when one gazes long into an abyss, the abyss gazes also into thee. And it's... and it's pretty funny, actually. <coughs>